Thule, known as the Land of Giants, is a wilderness area of big skies, rocky copies, amazing views and massive trees. It is rich in history, from the days of the early inhabitants of Stone Age and Iron Age peoples, to the endless conflicts between the chiefs Lobangula and Kama. It was the hunting grounds of famous hunters such as Salu, and the playground for Cecil John Rhodes and Paul Kruger. Today, Tudi is less turbulent, but still not without the conflict between the wildlife and the communities of the area. The Thule block, situated in eastern Botswana, is an area of many hundreds of square kilometers. The number of people in this area fluctuates from as many as 3,000 people in towns like Matatani to as few as 10 people in the cattle posts. The wildlife is free to move within this area without the usual constraints of fences as is found within most game reserves these days. The wildlife is spectacular. The area is home to over 350 bird species and 48 larger mammal species. Thule is to be a part of the proposed limpopo Shashi Transfrontier Park that will incorporate South Africa, Zimbabwe and Botswana, creating a safe wildlife haven of 4,872 square kilometers. The harsh and untamed vastness of the area and its general inaccessibility has meant that very little is truly known about the nature in this region. This is where we, the Thule Conservation Project, come into play. in 2005 is aimed towards providing a research monitoring project that benefits and assists other studies currently taking place within the Thule block, as well as serving a purpose for data comparisons with research undertaken in other areas. The project has created its own database which gives a general overview as to the populations and dynamics of as much of the natural environment within the study area as possible. The baseline data that is being obtained will be vital in the years to come for assisting in determining what changes, both positive and negative, the creation of the Transfrontier Park will have had towards the area and its wildlife. Thule Wilderness has been identified as the central core study area for reasons of the lack of current data and knowledge within this area, the location of the student camp, the suitable road network and our sole traversing rights in this area at any time. The project is planned to be an ongoing study, hopefully for decades to come. The major benefit of this is that the dynamics and shifts due to changes in the natural environment create differing balances of equilibrium in the area, and these can only be determined over a lengthy period, and not over the year or two that most studies by academic students take place. All data capture is undertaken in a completely accurate manner, as if it is not, will not only the entire study of ours, but also that of others relying on us, be completely inaccurate and lead to mismanagement of natural resources and negative consequences to the environment. The study is not one undertaken by the coordinators or supervisors, but by the participants themselves. The role of the coordinators is to lead the project. Therefore, participants are often asked for their input and requested to undertake certain tasks in the data processing. The Thule Conservation Project does not orientate towards pure science research, as this would mean a far lesser degree of variation and excitement in daily activities and routines, and less of an opportunity for our participants to study and understand the natural environment in its entirety. For the benefit of all of those involved, and for the predetermined purpose of the project, we therefore focus more towards monitoring research. Due to the relationship between us and other researchers, for whom we are their satellite station, a few major animal research projects and their necessary data collection have been outlined, with elephant and predator studies being at the core. However, in order to understand how these are influenced by or influence other factors, it is also necessary to monitor and map general game populations and vegetation. Weather and climate have a large impact on animal movements and behavior, so daily weather sheets are undertaken. There is no external funding required for the project, as the participants' financial input for the experience ensures its existence. Their funds pay for all the required equipment to make the project work. Participants get satisfaction from what they put into conservation and the communities. Through their being involved in the project, employment is created for the local community, both directly and indirectly and upliftment and sponsorship of several community-based bodies takes place. Volunteers may also get involved in physical projects such as fence removal, snare collection, invasive plant clearing and combating soil erosion. 
From this, they get satisfaction in seeing an immediate outcome to their work and a benefit to the conservation of the area. The personal benefits to the participants involved are numerous. Many are passionate about conservation and want to pursue a career in this field. They get to learn hands-on what it entails and gain a tremendous amount of environmental knowledge from their time with us. A lot of practical experience is gained as they may even assist in servicing vehicles, fixing boreholes and pump problems along with any other maintenance. They experience their own personal growth in the therapeutic environment of the bush, where the clothes they wear, the car they drive and their family and work pressure all dissolve into insignificance. Time has no meaning for them when they are here. They eat when they are hungry and sleep when they are tired and work when there is work to do. On Saturdays, a good old party becomes the order of the hour. We strive to reach a balance between work and fun. The only negative effects that we have on our environment are the vehicle that is ethically driven around with minimal impact on the land and the several extra excited and beaming faces moving around the reserve. A lot of educational components are in place within the program. Feedbacks are usually given once a week, which is where the participants are given certain topics to research, be it an animal, a certain butterfly species, or a broad topic such as ecology. They then impart any interesting facts or facets that intrigue them from their readings. This is normally a very good means of group learning and is generally enjoyed by all. Participants may learn how to utilize GIS mapping programs, GPS units, communicate on radios and the like, as well as to learn how the data is processed into usable format. Computers are not only invaluable for work purposes, but also for education. Bird games are played as a learning aid, PowerPoint presentations on tracking are done, wildlife DVDs are watched and many other software programs are utilized. Plant pressings are undertaken, plaster casts of tracks are made, language lessons are given, and activities such as stargazing are done. Entire days may on occasion be made up to incorporate an aspect of nature during our regular activities. These may be comprised of tree identifications using tree keys, bird watching expeditions, or arthropod identifications. Track and sign recognition and trailing comprise some of our most important educational components as a lot of work is based on these factors and the more trained eyes we have looking for signs the better. Participants need to pass a test before they can take up the role as a tracker and spotlighter on the tracker seat and then they also take up the rear guard when we are on foot. The Thule Conservation Project Camp is nestled on the banks of the Mojave River where there is always a plethora of birds and animals in and around Mojave Camp. Some of the visitors are very friendly, such as the resident tree squirrels. Other visitors, however, are to be avoided when they prowl around the camp in the middle of the night. During the winter months, elephants are around most nights, sometimes in herds of over 200, and the bulls may come right into the camp and feed on the trees next to the larpa, leaving a very nervous student lying in their tent waiting for it to move on so they can use the toilet. Porcupines, civets, genets, wildcats, impala, kudu, baboons, vervet monkeys, both spotted and brown hyenas, and even leopard make up other visitors. The camp is not always so idyllically scenic. With the beauty and peacefulness, there has to be a negative side. This comes outside of the rainy season in the form of winds, where dust is blown over everything. The name Thule even means dust. The summer is also not without its perils, as Parabutha scorpions become active within the camp, and Mozambique spitting cobras and other snakes take up residence. It is not the time to be walking without shoes. But all of this is certainly bearable, as the beauty of the camp and its surrounds overawes one. Access to the camp is usually via Pont Drift border post, where we often have to drive through deep water in the rainy season. Students are picked up from the border and the journey takes about an hour to reach the camp. Access is only with a four-wheel drive vehicle. When the river comes down in full spate, the trip in and out is a bit more exciting as the students have to cross the river in a cable car. The roads from there on are also more like rivers than roads. The camp consists of very basic but comfortable units with communal rustic outdoor bathrooms. We have permanent structures in place for our kitchen and dining area. There is no electricity, 
so hot water has to be created by donkey boilers. Inverters provide us with 220 volt electricity from vehicle batteries with which we charge electrical equipment. Gas is utilized for the fridges, freezers and cookers while lighting at night is gained from gas and paraffin lamps. Clothes are hand washed for the participants on a twice weekly basis with linen being done weekly. Participants are required to undertake set duties each day on a rotational basis. This ensures that everyone plays a role for the day in our research activities when in the field, as well as ensuring that the camp is of a neat, tidy and hygienic condition. Participants take it in turns to cook, host and clean up dinners for the group. Town trips are generally done on a fortnightly basis to enable participants to stock up on supplies. Nobody knows what is in store for them for the day until they are awoken. The plan for the day is outlined on a whiteboard and may change depending on what the weather is like or what is found during the day. The plan tends to be more of a rough guide. If anything interesting is heard in the middle of the night, everyone is gathered and off we go. Some days may start at 2 in the morning and be very intense, whereas other days may be more relaxed if it is a boiling hot day. The project has numerous focal points with the primary focuses being on predator and elephant research monitoring. We try to run continuously throughout the year so as not to leave gaps in our data collection. The many data sheets form the basis of our work and these are religiously typed up and backed up on a weekly basis. These are filled in whenever we have any sightings or find tracks or signs. They are varied in their content and purpose but invariably are all related in some way or another. Included in our data sheets are elephant sightings, distant elephant sightings, bull must recordings, predator recordings, raptor recordings, predator tracks, interesting sightings, smaller mammal sightings, night drive sightings, weather, bird lists, mortalities and water counts. Others are included from time to time depending what we are doing. For instance a vegetation damage and mapping data sheet comes into play whenever we collect data related to this factor. Those relevant to other researchers are sent off to them on CD. The bonus of having so many of us involved in the data collection is that the work can be evenly distributed amongst all and more can therefore be covered. Our data collection is undertaken primarily in a Land Rover but a lot of the work has to be foot based due to poor vehicle access in certain areas. Tracking is of vital importance in our work as we pick up a lot of things that we would otherwise miss. Predators and carcasses are often found through hard tracking. We are currently drawing up as many checklists as we can on what occurs in the area. Bird, amphibian, butterfly, reptile, mammal, scorpion, insect and vegetation lists are added to whenever anything new has been found. It happens more often than one would expect. Two different starting points. This ensures that we cover all the areas of our core study area and that we start in different areas each time. So that, for instance, game is counted at the river at varying times of the day and not always when the day is hot and the game concentrations at the river will be greater. Each participant is given a set grouping that they need to count as we see the animals, be it males, females, sub-adults, juveniles or a total count. This information is mapped and correlated to all other environmental aspects to try to determine what causes the distributions and concentrations. Zebra and wildebeest are less commonly seen during the dry months but come flooding back during the wet season when the grass grows back. The local migration patterns of some mammal species is still a mystery. A lot of information has been documented by us that deviates from the norm that many books state. Fixed point photographs are taken on a monthly basis from six different sites. 360 degree vegetation photos are taken as well as ground level photos. From these we see seasonal changes in the vegetation and can correlate this to our game counts and the absence or presence of certain game species. In the longer term it can be used to determine elephant impact on the land and the effects of other environmental factors. Camera traps are of great assistance and continue to collect data whilst we rest. We use them extensively at times and they are fantastic in assisting to build our predator identification kits. Our map is most vital to recording localities and is divided up into grid squares of 500 by 500 meters with a topographic map and drainage map overlaid on it. A number of features have been named and added so as to determine where we are with ease. The task of map reading is one of the duties that participants need to fulfill. 
Identification kits are made up for all the predators and elephants that we encounter and manage to succeed in taking usable ID photographs. The leopards are identified by their whisker and spot patterns, and tracks are measured and used as a means to determine movement patterns. Elephant identifications are done via ear, tusk and tail photos. In our quest to figure out the leopard population, many nights are spent searching, and entire nights may be spent out, moving, then waiting and listening. We may bunk down for an hour at a time, with a volunteer on watch duty that will wake everyone if leopards are heard calling, or if other animals are heard alarm calling. Collars have been fitted to several animals to get a better understanding of movement patterns. General sleepouts are also done for the pleasure of being in the bush, as well as to see if anything is heard in the area. Comprehensive photographic databases are being built up of the vegetation and all else that occurs in the area. All general information is written up on a daily, weekly and monthly basis by the students in the forms of logs and reports. These reports give a general idea in layman's format as to what is happening in the area and what we are accomplishing. Elephants are synonymous with the name Thule. There are a number of tuskless females, and the population is very lopsided in sex ratios, with a lot more females than males. There is still considerable conflict between local communities and the elephants. The Thule elephant population was decimated in earlier years through hunting, and they were eventually completely hunted out, with the last one being shot in the late 1890s. Not a single elephant was seen again in the Thule until 1947, when a farmer saw a lone bull. Since then, the population has grown to its current estimated number of 1,700 elephants. A lot seem to have flooded in from neighboring regions, and growth through reproduction has been very rapid, with birth intervals of four years between calves. At one stage, the Thule elephants were reputed to be the most aggressive population, but they seem to have calmed down considerably in the present day. However, there are still a number of local people killed by them each year. The Thule lion population has been seriously reduced in recent years through conflict with humans. Farmers on the South African side are responsible for shooting a number of known individuals just for the sake of shooting a lion. And local farmers poison carcasses to rid their grazing lands of predators. When lion prides move into the villages, farmers shoot them and the survivors have to be removed from the area to avoid future conflicts as they have learned to feed on cattle and become a very real threat to the villagers. Following the introduction of a wild dog pack to the area, they did exceptionally well and had several litters. But a number of individuals have been killed in snares set by poachers, and the pack has been reduced and fragmented so considerably that their long-term chance of survival here is not looking very optimistic. Very little is known about the status of the cheetah population, but it appears to be very healthy. And although seen fairly regularly, there may be times of the year when they are just not to be found in the core study area, and possibly move away because of conflict with other predators such as lions. Leopards are in great abundance in Thule, and fresh tracks are to be found everywhere. But the animals themselves are not regularly seen, and patience and perseverance is required to get sightings of these cats. Thule is the most incredible area and its seasonal changes are probably the most intriguing and fascinating aspect out of all. To be truly encapsulated by the area, one ideally needs to see it throughout its annual cycle. One sees the dust bath in the dry season turn into a lush paradise shortly after the first spring rains, and the wild flowers and grass come to life for a little while before vanishing once again. One sees the trees that appear dead suddenly grow new leaves and burst into full bloom. One sees life in the form of water come trickling down the dry riverbed after the first rains, and watch as it turns into a ruthless monster, and then see it slowly dry up again. One sees the seasonal cycles of mapani worms devouring the leaves of all of the trees, and the millions and millions of brown-veined white butterflies that fly through in a northeasterly direction. One sees the quelias coming in in clouds that block out the sun, and then leave again. One sees the arrivals and departures of the elephant mega herds and general game species, of the insects and scorpions, of the snakes, lizards and tortoises, of the migrant birds, of the crocodiles and hippo, and everything else that nature has to offer. One helplessly watches the animals suffering and dying in their dozens as the water and graze disappears, and the area turns into a scene of destruction and sadness. 
But the rains do come again, and life is reborn, and so the cycle. One sees once in a lifetime sights. This is what the Thule area and the Thule Conservation Project are about.